The sky captivates us. Humanity has always gazed fondly at the sky into its distant depths. Since ancient times, the sky has been a guide for us. In antiquity, peoples in the regions of Europe and Asia used the phases of the moon as a reference for agricultural activities. The moon directly influences plants, their growth, health, and fertility. Various positions of the moon relative to our planet can affect activities related to the Earth positively or negatively. Travelers in deep deserts oriented their paths by the stars, with the sun being the most prominent among them. With the advancement of science, humans began to explore space. The first telescopes appeared, enabling people to discover other galaxies. Our film will focus on such galaxies, revealing the incredible beauties of our universe. What do trillions of the most distant galaxies hide in their depths? And what worlds may exist among them? Why, in an expanding universe, we can still encounter the Andromeda Galaxy? And will our planet die from it, or perhaps something else will end it sooner? And how did Einstein understand that our universe is distorted? You will find the answers to these questions in our film. Welcome to the Space Progress Channel. Subscribe and let's begin. In our videos, we have already mentioned IC 1101, the largest galaxy in the observable universe. In brief, this giant has a diameter of 6 million light years, almost 60 times the diameter of the Milky Way. If it were in the position of our galaxy, galaxies like Andromeda, the Triangulum Galaxy, the large and small Magellanic Clouds would be engulfed by this giant. Without a doubt, among other galaxies, IC 1101 is a true monster. However, its size pales in comparison to another class of objects, radio galaxies. Radio galaxies are extremely rare objects in the universe. These colossal objects have a supermassive black hole at their center, actively absorbing gas and dust from the surrounding environment. This activity initiates the launch of high-energy jet streams capable of accelerating charged particles around the supermassive black hole, almost to the speed of light. Such elements are very clearly observed in radio waves. In most cases, they have a length of 1,000 light years or even more. The difference from a regular galaxy is that they have much greater radio emission, often surpassing their optical luminosity. Speaking of radio galaxies, we cannot fail to mention J1420-0545. Currently, it is the largest known representative of radio galaxies. Located on the border of the constellations Draco and Urza Minor, it is approximately 2 billion 300 million light years away from Earth. It has the largest radio structure of all ever observed. These structures are spheres or cocoons formed by shock plasma, and the jets expand outward into the intergalactic medium. To say that this radio galaxy is huge is an understatement. Its extent is four whole 69 hundredths of a megaparsec, or about 16 million light years. And its mass, by the most modest estimates, reaches 185 trillion solar masses. It is almost three times larger than the aforementioned IC 1101. Just imagine these dimensions. Information about the object itself is very scarce. Much more is known about the spherical shell. However, we have still learned something. J1420-0545 was discovered in the distant year 2008 in the form of two radio source lobes located 17.4 inches apart. Subsequent observations conducted on the giant Metrowave radio telescope confirmed that there is a core halfway between them, corresponding to a previously known faint galaxy. Redshift values were available but had large uncertainties. Therefore, additionally, in 2015, optical photometry was carried out at the Mount Suhora Observatory. The obtained data proved to be very useful. Spectroscopy revealed which galaxy astronomers were observing. Unlike radio wave lobes, optical radiation from the center was not visible, and it was impossible to depict the galaxy as we could. J1420-0545 is an elliptical galaxy, a type that typically represents old galaxies formed over time through the merging and collisions of smaller galaxies of various types. Star formation levels are low, indicating that there are relatively few young blue stars compared to star-forming spiral or lenticular galaxies. Currently, a decrease in radiation is observed at some wavelengths due to the absorption of metals in stellar atmospheres. In most galaxies, hot stars fill this gap if present, but in elliptical galaxies, there are very few hot stars. But how did it become so large then? 
A radio galaxy of this size is not unique. The giant object 3C236 had already been discovered earlier with a diameter of about 15 million light years or 4.4 megaparsecs and an age of approximately 110 million years. However, what is surprising is that the age of J1420-05-45 is only 47 million years. So why is a relatively young radio galaxy so large? The answer lies in the intergalactic medium, specifically the hot plasma filling the space between galaxies. The substance's density at its center is 20 times lower than in the center of 3C236. The gas pressure opposing the expansion of the jets is also significantly lower, and the power of the galactic core in J1420 is half greater than the comparable core in 3C236. This, combined with the substantially lower density of the surrounding environment, meant that they experienced much less resistance as they moved into intergalactic space, allowing them to expand faster and farther in a shorter time. The question arose, why is the local substance so rarefied and on such a large scale? Initially, a group of scientists believed it was simply a natural region of space, resembling a void. Low density over tens of megaparsecs formed soon after the Big Bang. However, after additional measurements, they considered an alternative version. The jets were the result of the growth of galactic core activity. The team of astronomers proposed classifying J1420 as a double radio galaxy. It has two pairs of lobes aligned within a few degrees, indicating that the central active galactic core experienced a period of activity shut down and then restarted. Moreover, since the jets are narrow, this is characteristic of double radio galaxies undergoing a second period of activity. If this hypothesis is correct, then there should be a second, weaker core. After the first period of activity, the shell should have cooled rapidly due to energy losses from synchrotron radiation. Does J1420 deserve the title of the largest known radio galaxy? A question that remains open to this day. It is still unknown how large its stellar hollow hollow is, but it is undoubtedly much smaller than the giant spherical shell that surrounds it. At the same time, this shell represents a very clear boundary between the galaxy and the intergalactic medium, and the shocked plasma inside it should behave differently than the plasma in the intergalactic medium. Ironically, unlike ordinary elliptical galaxies that have scattered halos, we can pinpoint where this giant ends and where intergalactic space begins. Perhaps one day, we will discover and explore another giant radio galaxy, even larger than J1420, and do it so well that it will answer all questions. However, for now, this question should remain open. All we need to do for now is wait and see. The largest galaxy astronomers have observed is the famous IC1101, which we have discussed in more detail before. It is located very far away in the Virgo constellation, but most importantly, it is elliptical in type. This means that although one needs to strive to grow to such colossal sizes, the process and the reason for such formations have long been known to us. On the other hand, spiral galaxies like our own live in one of these. Just one significant merger, when two galaxies of comparable mass interact to form one large galaxy, and that's it. The spiral structure is destroyed, replaced by a giant elliptical one, like IC1101. Huge spiral galaxies that our telescopes detect today are usually in the process of gravitational interaction with their neighbor, creating an extended but temporary large spiral structure. But there is one galaxy in the universe that breaks this rule, unofficially known as the Rubin Galaxy, in honor of astronomer Vera Rubin, who first discovered it, it is officially named UGC 2885. It is much larger than any other known spiral galaxy. With a diameter of 800,000 light years, it is almost eight times larger than the Milky Way and nearly four times larger than Andromeda, which happens to be the largest in the local group. Rubin's galaxy contains approximately four trillion stars, and its mass is estimated at two trillion times that of the Sun. What's most interesting is that its distance from us is only 230 million light years, close enough to be photographed and studied in detail. How did this unusual galaxy form, and how did it manage to grow to such incredible sizes? Theoretically, there are two ways how large spiral galaxies form and both begin similarly. In the young universe, a large cloud of matter begins to collapse under its own gravity. 
While dark matter accounts for most of the mass, it only interacts gravitationally and cannot collide, lose angular momentum or collapse. Ordinary matter, on the other hand, can interact with itself. As it collapses, various atoms, molecules and other particles collide and interact. Matter loses angular momentum, breaks apart and forms a disk, which then rotates. This source of a disk-like structure is present in all spiral galaxies. As far as we can judge today, all galaxies start small and grow in two possible ways. Intergalactic gas can be gravitationally attracted from the surrounding, less dense areas of space. This slow and gradual penetration of matter into the galaxy provides resources for new generations of stars, settling in the existing spiral disk structure of the galaxy, making it slightly thicker and significantly larger in size. Smaller galaxies, as well as proto-galaxies, can merge into a larger one through mergers. This process is slightly different because these objects already have stars and structures inside them, and they will be torn apart before eventually settling as part of a larger spiral and growing thicker and larger. Both of these processes are happening in the universe, with the second occurring now with those dwarf galaxies surrounding our Milky Way. But if two galaxies of comparable size ever merge, a huge portion of the gas contained in both objects will collapse, and as a result, an outside observer can witness an impressive astronomical event known as a starburst. The entire galaxy literally turns into a giant star-forming factory. Usually, this consumes most of the gas present in the new galaxy, and then star formation stops. Stars are born in a large volume of space, forming an elliptical structure rather than a spiral. And then, as the galaxy ages, the most massive ones die, leaving only smaller, cooler, and redder stars. Elliptical galaxies are known for having very few cases of star formation after the initial burst. Therefore, they are the largest and most massive structures. Considering all these facts, let's now take a close look at the UGC 2885 spiral galaxy. Surprisingly, we won't find any traces of major mergers here. This spiral object either grew through gas accretion or through small mergers, but most importantly, not through any other processes. But how do we correctly understand and comprehend the reason for such growth? Astronomers found a very clever way. We need to look at the globular clusters inside the galaxy. Every time a major starburst occurs, it not only generates new stars evenly scattered throughout the galaxy, but also forms huge, dense clusters of stars. From tens of thousands to millions of new celestial bodies, all within a few dozen light years. This is what a globular cluster is. Each spiral galaxy has its own unique population of globular clusters scattered throughout its halo. Let's start by looking at our Milky Way. The clusters within it are extremely old, forming around 12 to 13 billion years ago. However, we also find globular clusters that are much younger. This suggests that at different times, there were multiple collisions with smaller galaxies and the influx of gas triggered new bursts of star formation and the formation of new globular clusters. So, we need to measure the ages of the globular clusters in the Rubin galaxy and then we'll understand what significant mergers occurred in the past, as well as how starbursts and the creation of new globular clusters occurred. When the Hubble Space Telescope observed this galaxy, something unprecedented was discovered. Firstly, all the identified globular clusters had different colors, indicating that they formed at different times as a result of the gradual inflow of gas. It was also found that there is no large number of globular clusters that could have formed approximately at the same time. This implies that there were no major or medium-sized mergers in the history of the Rubin galaxy. This evidence, in itself, argues in favor of the scenario of gradual gas accretion rather than the accretion of mergers with surrounding smaller galaxies. The second piece of evidence is even more compelling. The number of globular clusters found in this spiral galaxy is very small for its mass. From this, it follows that there were no serious bursts of intense star formation from very early times, which would be caused by mergers or gravitational interactions. There are no massive structures nearby with an undisturbed internal structure and no clues at all to explain how this spiral galaxy increased to such sizes. Everything indicates that it formed only as a result of the gradual accretion of matter. In our vicinity, the most similar galaxy is M83. It is a quiet small galaxy with a diameter of 40,000 light years located in the Hydra constellation. 
It is also relatively isolated, with no massive galaxies in its vicinity, has only one stable core, and undergoes stable and very slow star formation along its spiral arms. However, UGC 2885 is the first huge galaxy to date with such combined properties. Additionally, new Hubble images clearly show the presence of a small bridge intersecting the ring structure of the core. This is very strange, because most bridges are believed to form due to minor gravitational disturbances caused by satellites and neighboring galaxies. But here, there are none, so the bridges may form due to other forces, such as interactions between stars, gas and dust, as well as the influence of dark matter. The fact that such a large and massive galaxy has such a symmetrical shape, along with such a slow rate of star formation and a small number of globular clusters, truly makes it a unique cosmic gem. It is the first of its kind not only because it is so beautifully symmetrical, but also because it grew to such immense sizes without a single major disruptive event. Imagine in the entire universe, with trillions of galaxies, there might not be another galaxy like it. Certainly, it is likely just the first discovery of a new type of unusually sized spiral galaxy. In the deep cosmos, there are many noteworthy objects and beautiful phenomena. Somewhere out there is the Tarantula Nebula, where active star formation is currently taking place. There's the most massive star ever observed by humanity. All these cosmic wonders are united by the place where they are located. The Large Magellanic Cloud. Despite its modest size, it hides not only all the mentioned objects but also numerous secrets and mysteries. The Large Magellanic Cloud is located at a distance of 163,000 light-years from us. It is a dwarf spiral galaxy with a bridge, one of the satellites of the Milky Way. You heard it right, not only planets have satellites. Due to its unusual shape, it is classified as an irregular galaxy. Its structure exhibits significant distortions caused by tidal interactions with its younger sibling, the Small Magellanic Cloud, and our Milky Way. The diameter of the Large Magellanic Cloud is approximately 10 times smaller than our galaxy, but its mass is 300 times less. Its radius is about 14,000 light-years. The Large Magellanic Cloud has been studied for many centuries, with sailors in medieval times showing a special interest in it. For instance, Magellan used the galaxy for navigational calculations during his circumnavigation. This is how it received its modern name. However, only in 2013 did astronomers manage to accurately calculate the distance to it, and slightly earlier, in 2006, measurements with the Hubble telescope helped determine the galaxy's rotation period, which is 250 million years. Both the large and small Magellanic clouds form simultaneously with our galaxy. About 700 million years ago, the Large Magellanic Cloud sped past the Milky Way at a speed of 327 kilometers per second, establishing its current distance at 163,000 light-years, which will gradually decrease over time. Like most irregular galaxies, it is rich in gas and dust, so active star formation is currently taking place here. It's an astronomical treasure trove, with around 60 globular clusters, 400 planetary nebulae, 700 open clusters, and hundreds of thousands of giant and supergiant stars. Over 30 billion stars are located in this region and believe there is much to marvel at. Some true gems in the Large Magellanic Cloud include the largest star, WOH J64, surrounded by a gas and dust torus, or the brightest hypergeant. S. Doradus, located in the northern part of the galaxy. If this star were in the place of the nearest Proxima Centauri, there would be no darkness on Earth. The unusual dynamics not typical for a galaxy of such a vast age, accompanying the birth of new stars, are of particular scientific interest. There are many of them here, and they are much younger than the youngest stars in the Milky Way. The Tarantula Nebula serves as the focal point of active star formation, a true stellar nursery. Here, we'll make a brief stop and take a closer look because this constellation is special. But first, let's understand what a nebula is. Originally in astronomy, any extended objects in deep space were considered nebulae, and only later, thanks to the ability to precisely identify such objects, did the term nebulae receive a more strict definition. Nebulae consist mainly of clusters of dust, gas, helium, and plasma. 
They come in different types. For example, the Coal Sack Nebula is a dark nebula where dense formations of interstellar gas and dust are concentrated. And there are so many of them that it completely absorbs light. There are also reflection nebulae that shine due to the reflection of radiation from bright stars within them. Nebulae created by shock waves exist. They appear as a result of explosive ejections of matter by stars during supernova explosions, as well as due to stellar winds from stars like Wolfrayet. Emission nebulae, on the other hand, are clouds of ionized gas emitting intense radiation. In the visible range, ionization in them mostly occurs due to high-energy photon streams from young stars with high temperatures. This is the type to which the NGC 2070 nebula belongs, which we colorfully call the tarantula due to its resemblance to the famous spider. The tarantula spans 700 light years. Essentially, everything here is a region of ionized hydrogen. The distance to it is 179,000 light years. Imagine if we swap the tarantula with the Orion Nebula. It would not only be visible to the naked eye in the night sky, but also 55 times larger than the full moon. The nebula contains 800,000 stars, including relatively recently formed protostars still hidden in cocoons of cosmic dust. The central part of the nebula contains a small but extremely bright cluster, R136, which emits most of the energy, allowing the nebula to glow. This is where the most massive of all known stars, R136, A1, is located. The weight of this giant exceeds that of the Sun by 265 times. Thanks to its brightness, this region is superb for studying stellar evolution processes. In 1987, a supernova erupted on the edge of this nebula, so bright that it was visible from Earth with the naked eye for some time. It was later assigned the name SN 1987. This supernova formed from a blue supergiant, 17 times the mass of the Sun. It significantly influenced our understanding of stellar evolution. For example, it was previously believed that only red supergiants and wolf riot stars could trigger supernova. But further X-ray and gamma-ray observations allowed unveiling the mystery of SN 1987. It all started with the merger of two stars, a large one and a relatively small one forming a rapidly rotating blue supergiant, and relatively recently, in images taken by a complex of radio telescopes in the Atacama Desert, signs of a young neutron star were discovered in the remnants of the supernova. The pulsar is still surrounded by dense layers of clouds, but in the next decade they will disperse, allowing us to directly observe the neutron star's radiation. In the distant future, our descendants can expect truly stunning changes in the astronomical view of the world We've already mentioned that the Large Magellanic Cloud experiences strong gravitational influence from our galaxy. This means that in approximately two and a half billion years, the Milky Way will begin the process of absorbing the Large Magellanic Cloud. Such a collision will awaken the dormant Sagittarius A black hole at the center of our galaxy, likely increasing its mass tenfold, possibly transforming it into a powerful quasar. However, these are still subjects of debate. But what does this mean for the future of Earth and its inhabitants, if any remain by then? Most likely, the inhabitants of our planet will be able to witness the brightest cosmic fireworks of high-energy radiation emanating from the vicinity of the black hole. However, some astrophysicists predict a different outcome, the ejection of the solar system from the galaxy. And after that, in a billion years, Andromeda will begin the process of absorbing the Milky Way, in general, exciting times are ahead and hopefully, by then, Earth's inhabitants will be prepared for the collision and, if necessary, take measures to preserve our species. Meanwhile, we can observe the Large Magellanic Cloud as a beautiful object in the night sky. Looking at the night sky through the curtain of the Milky Way stars, one can't help but feel like a tiny speck on the edge of the great abyss of the universe. Scientists have only recently managed to estimate the number of galaxies. For a long time, this was a mystery and estimates fluctuated from tens of millions to hundreds of billions as telescopes improved. Let's think about how we can count them at all. One option would be to manually point telescopes into the sky and collect the light emitted by each galaxy, regardless of how faint it is. It would be a long and meticulous process one by one. But this option doesn't work because our telescopes are limited in their capabilities, which in turn limits the amount of light they can gather and the resolution they can achieve. 
The farther the object, the fainter the light it emits. At some point, the source of this light is so far away that even observing for a hundred years will reveal nothing. Instead, we can observe the visible part of the universe. In the 1990s, scientists using the Hubble Space Telescope implemented the Hubble Deep Field Project. They photographed a tiny section of the starry sky, counted all the galaxies in it, and then applied these data to the rest of the universe. It didn't turn out very well. The most distant galaxies are involved in the expansion of the universe, causing them to shift into the red region beyond the point where our optical and near-infrared telescopes could detect them. The final sizes and observation times meant that only galaxies above a certain brightness threshold could be seen. Very small, low-mass galaxies would emit too weak a light to be noticed. The results were there, but too approximate. A much better attempt was the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, a composite image of ultraviolet, optical, and infrared data. It created a tiny piece of the sky, and astronomers duplicated it, covering the entire remaining map of the universe. A little over 32 million such pieces were created, Combining ultraviolet, optical, and infrared data into one image revealed a total of about five and a half thousand galaxies. On one such patch, it represented the highest galaxy density ever observed. To estimate the number of galaxies in the universe, you take the number observed in one image and multiply it by the number of remaining pieces on the map. It turns out that five and a half thousand multiplied by 32 million gives a staggering number. 176 billion galaxies. But this estimate is a lower limit. It doesn't account for galaxies that are too faint, too small, or too closely spaced to be visible. Galaxies hidden by neutral gas and dust, as well as those beyond the capabilities of the Hubble's redshift, are nowhere to be seen. Yet, since these galaxies exist nearby, they must also exist in the young distant universe. Therefore, for a proper estimate, understanding how the universe forms and evolves is crucial. Knowing the fundamental laws of physics allows us to create various computer models, simulating the formation of stars, the creation of galaxies, and then comparing how these models align with the nearby and distant universe that we actually observe. In the early universe, there were more galaxies than today. This is not surprising, as they were smaller, low mass, and destined to merge over time. The most realistic modeling that corresponds to reality includes dark matter, dark energy and small fluctuations that eventually grow into stars, galaxies and galaxy clusters. Examining this modeling, which best corresponds to observed data, gives us a number that is not a lower limit that rather estimates the true number of galaxies in our observable universe. As of today, there should be around 2 trillion galaxies. This number is undoubtedly enormous, but it doesn't even account for those beyond our visibility. So, let's rephrase the next question. How many galaxies have permanently disappeared from our view? The farther galaxies are from us, the faster they are receding. At a certain point, as you might guess, these galaxies will recede from us faster than the speed of light, meaning we will not only never reach them, but won't even see them. Our brief cosmic history is theoretically well understood, but only in a qualitative sense. Through observational confirmation and unveiling various stages of the universe's past development, such as the formation of the first stars and galaxies, we think we understand space, and not without reason. The Big Bang sets a fundamental limit on how far we can look in any direction. We see galaxies because they form stars that produce light, and this light travels through the expanding universe until it reaches our eyes. It seems simple enough, so when we look at the universe, we expect to see galaxies everywhere, but we just don't. The first reason is quite simple. The universe had a limited amount of time to do all of this. The Big Bang created the universe approximately 13.8 billion years ago, and the first stars formed tens or hundreds of millions of years later. Right now, this very first light is reaching the eyes and lenses of our sophisticated equipment. However, not all galaxies are visible. Our universe expanded due to a mixture of neutrino radiation, ordinary matter, dark matter, and dark energy. Based on the universe's history, light can travel a distance of up to 46 billion light years, but that doesn't mean an object that is 46 billion light years away from us today will emit something we can see. It simply means that if an object emitted light 13.8 billion years ago, we will receive that light now, 
indicating that the object that emitted it then is now 46 billion light years away from us. This is the limit of what we can see in the observable universe. We can see no more than two trillion galaxies. This is a huge number, and gradually, all of them will be revealed to us. All galaxies that we have ever observed, as long as they have stars, will not disappear. Plus, new ones will be discovered. The fact that the universe's expansion is accelerating will not change this. Once light arrives from a distant object, as long as that object is emitting photons, the universe's expansion will not prevent their arrival. In this regard, no galaxy has disappeared from our view, but the universe's expansion, especially its acceleration, will impact the following two things. In the future, there will be a limit to how far we can observe distant objects. The limit exists today and changes over time, relative to how far galaxies can be from us and still send us new light. Today, we can look at best 46 billion light years. This is the current visibility limit. We can calculate the future visibility limit and find that it is 33% larger than the current one. Someday, we will observe about 4.7 trillion galaxies, and over time, light from super-distant galaxies will arrive. But this is mostly light that, from our point of view, was emitted billions and billions of years ago. When we look at distant parts of the universe, we are not only looking back in time, but also seeing galaxies that no longer exist. Therefore, the light emitted by these galaxies today, 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang, will never reach us. The thing is, the universe is expanding, and its expansion is accelerating. Distant galaxies are not only moving away from us due to the stretching of space-time, but they are doing so faster and faster. Currently, galaxies beyond 15 billion light-years are receding from us faster than the speed of light. So, even if we were to embark on a spacecraft moving at near light speed today, we would never reach these galaxies. The light we emit today will never reach them, and vice versa. This means that 96.7% of the galaxies we can observe today have already gone beyond our reach. However, approximately 66 billion galaxies are still accessible to us today. If we assume that each of these 66 billion galaxies has as many stars as the Milky Way, roughly 400 billion, it means that about 60,000 stars disappear from our view every second. While you were watching this video, more than 36 million stars have permanently vanished. We can still see their old light, but any new light they generate will never reach us. Think about what you know about Andromeda today. Yes, it's the closest galaxy to the Milky Way. We are heading towards each other, it's larger than ours, and so on. In other words, all our knowledge is in such general terms. But what if Andromeda, in one not-so-beautiful moment, collides with our Milky Way? Who would be the winner in this clash? Let's get to know the enemy. Like the Milky Way, Andromeda is part of the local group of galaxies, which includes over 50 other galaxies. Andromeda is the largest in this group, with an approximate diameter of 220,000 light-years, twice the size of ours. Consequently, Andromeda also has a significant number of stars. Calculations suggest around one trillion luminaries, including a large and rare population of hot and bright stars. Hot young stars usually appear blue, but those found in the Andromeda galaxy look more like aging stars. Similar to the Sun, stars that have burned their internal layers and exposed their hot blue cores. They are scattered throughout the galaxy's center and are the brightest in the ultraviolet range. Quite recently, astronomers also discovered that Andromeda has unusual stars recurrent novae. This is a class of stars that periodically, every few decades, experience powerful flashes. However, Andromeda's recurrent nova is special. It explodes every year and, interestingly, this activity has been going on for millions of years. With each explosion, the star sheds outer layers, forming a gas dust formation, the so-called remnant of the star. Thanks to frequent explosions, this star has the largest remnant, stretching almost 400 light years. Another interesting feature of Andromeda is its core. In the central part of the galaxy, there are two bright objects, P1 and P2, separated by a distance of only five light years. Each of them contains several million closely spaced young blue stars. However, it was later found that the two cores form not separate star clusters, but rather one bubble-shaped cluster and a supermassive black hole with a mass exceeding 140 million solar masses. Stars in the P1 clusters orbit very closely around the black hole, resembling planets around the Sun. 
This creates the effect of having a double core. There is an astronomical phenomenon called a globular star cluster. These are densely packed clusters of old stars tightly bound by gravity and can contain hundreds of thousands or even millions of stars. Globular clusters benefit astronomers by helping determine the age of the universe, often assisting in locating the center of the galaxy and so on. The Milky Way has at least 200 such clusters, but Andromeda has about 450. Moreover, if Andromeda's globular clusters had similar sizes to those of the Milky Way, their actual number would be much larger, around 700 or 2800. Interestingly, it is now to talk about this, but once the Andromeda galaxy was considered a nebula. Only in 1924 did astronomer Edwin Hubble declare it a galaxy and made the sensational statement that the Milky Way is not the only galaxy in the universe. The scariest and most dangerous thing about the Andromeda galaxy is that it is full of black holes. It's not surprising considering the number of stars, but it still sounds ominous. Most of these black holes are of medium mass, some located near the center of the galaxy, while others, though far from the center, are very close to each other. According to experts' estimates, they could merge into one supermassive black hole in less than 350 years. It's a bit spooky, isn't it? But all of this is trivial. Right at this moment, while you're watching this video, the Andromeda galaxy is hurtling through space at a truly cosmic speed of 120 kilometers per second directly toward us, heading towards the Milky Way. It sounds incredibly frightening, as if a massive truck losing control is heading towards us and is about to erase us from the face of the Earth. But scientists reassure us, saying that in reality, nothing terrible will happen. Firstly, the Andromeda galaxy is still very far from us, approximately 9.5 trillion kilometers from Earth. Previously, it was believed that both galaxies would cover this distance in 3.9 billion years. Still, in February of this year, thanks to the Gaia satellite, it was discovered that the collision would happen much later, in about four and a half billion years. A familiar phrase, isn't it? Yes, that's roughly how much time our star the sun has left to live. So even if there are people left at that time, if humanity survives despite its current tendency towards self-destruction, I think they will have more serious problems to deal with. The actual collision, or rather the merger of galaxies, will take a very long time. The process will last for hundreds of millions of years. And for this reason alone, none of us will have a chance to witness it from beginning to end. Therefore, the best we can do is simulate its various stages. Sometimes the phrase galaxy collision is associated with star collisions. Fragments from the collision, dust and gas, chaos in general. But despite such a massive event, all stars will survive after and during the collision. Galaxies have a lot of free space. Due to the low concentration of matter in both galaxies and the extreme distance between objects, collisions are practically impossible. The Milky Way and Andromeda will attract each other until their supermassive black holes, located at their centers, eventually merge into one. After that, an entirely different galaxy will be born, an elliptical one. Scientists have named it Milcomeda. If Earth still exists by that time, every night on it would be very bright, thanks to the presence of many new stars. Instead of the Milky Way's band of light, a more spheroidal light source would be visible. One of the largest and perhaps the most important scientific achievements of the past century was the discovery of the expansion of the universe. Distant galaxies are moving away from us and from each other faster than those closer. It seems as if the very fabric of space is stretching. On the largest scales, the density of matter and energy in the universe has been falling for billions of years and shows no sign of stopping. If you look far enough, you can see galaxies flying apart so fast that even if we were to send a spacecraft towards them at the speed of light today, it would never catch up. But all this doesn't fit well with our imagination. Hence the question arises, if the universe is expanding, why are galaxies colliding? Newton, when contemplating the universe for the first time, envisioned space as a grid, an absolute fixed entity filled with masses gravitationally attracting each other. However, as time passed, Einstein emerged realizing that this imagined grid was not fixed at all, not resembling Newton's conception. Einstein saw this grid as fabric, warped, distorted, and changing over time due to the presence of matter and energy. Moreover, it's matter and energy that determine its curvature. 
However, if space-time consisted only of various masses, they would inevitably collapse and form a black hole. Einstein didn't like this idea, so he introduced a correction in the form of a cosmological constant. If this additional term exists in the equation, an additional energy permeating empty space. It could repel all these masses and keep the universe in a static state, preventing gravitational collapse. By adding it, Einstein allowed the universe to exist in an almost stationary state that is static and eternal. The idea of a static universe attracted some scientists, but certainly not all. Russian physicist Alexander Friedman showed that if you don't add this cosmological constant and fill the universe with energy matter, radiation, dust and so on, there are two classes of solutions, one for a contracting universe and another for an expanding one. Mathematics provides us with possible solutions, but you need to look at the physical universe to find out which one describes it. This happened in the 1920s, thanks to the work of Edwin Hubble, one of the most influential cosmologists of the past century. Hubble first discovered that the characteristics of individual stars in other galaxies could be measured, and their distance determined by combining these measurements with the work of astronomer Vesto Slipher, who showed that these objects exhibit a shift in the atomic spectrum. He got an amazing result. Either the theory of relativity is wrong, and we are at the center of the universe with everything symmetrically moving away from us, or the theory of relativity is correct. Friedman is right, and the farther a galaxy is from us, the faster it is, on average, moving away from us. In one fell swoop, the theory of an expanding universe moved from a simple idea to a leading one in describing the universe. The expansion of the universe is a complex and difficult to digest process for the average person, filled with various physical and mathematical formulas. However, this expansion works a bit strangely and contradicts common sense. It seems as if the fabric of space stretches over time, and all objects in this space drift apart from each other. The farther an object is from another, the greater the stretching between them, and the faster they move away from each other. If the universe were uniformly filled with matter, then the matter would simply become less dense, and each of its parts would move away from all the others over time. So why do galaxies collide then? The universe is a kind of hierarchy. Nearby galaxies turn into clusters, and they in turn form superclusters of galaxies. The expansion of the universe occurs uniformly everywhere, and it acts on a large scale within one cluster of galaxies connected by gravitational attraction. Moreover, they are relatively close to each other at a distance of about a couple of hundred thousand light years. Therefore, such objects can approach or move away independently of the overall expansion of the universe. This is why galaxy collisions occur. Now let's add another question related to the same topic. It sounds something like this. If the universe is expanding, why doesn't the distance between planets in our solar system change? In that case, Earth should be moving away from the Sun, but this is not happening. The universe is not perfectly uniform. It has regions of increased density, such as planets, stars, galaxies, and galaxy clusters. There are also regions of decreased density, like vast cosmic voids where there are practically no massive objects. The reason for this is the presence of other physical phenomena besides the expansion of the universe. On small scales, the size of an asteroid or smaller, electromagnetism and nuclear forces prevail. On large scales, such as planets, solar systems and galaxies, gravitational influence predominates. On the largest scales, comparable to the size of the universe, the main struggle unfolds between the expansion of the universe and the gravitational attraction of all the matter and energy within it. On these largest scales, expansion prevails, the farthest galaxies are moving away so fast that no signals we could send to them, even at the speed of light, will ever reach them. The superclusters of the universe, long filamentous structures along which galaxies line up, stretching for billions of light years, are expanding and spreading apart due to the expansion of the universe. They will disappear in a relatively short time. Even the galaxy cluster closest to the Milky Way, the Virgo Cluster, located just 50 million light years away from us, will not pull us toward it. Despite its gravitational attraction, more than a thousand times greater than our own, the expansion of the universe will push us away. On small scales, gravity wins, while on large scales, expansion prevails. The Virgo Cluster will remain gravitationally bound. The Milky Way and the entire local group of galaxies will remain bound and eventually merge due to gravity. 
Earth will continue to move in orbit around the Sun at the same distance and remain the same size, and the atoms that make it up will not expand. Why? Because the expansion of the universe only works where other interactions such as gravitational, electromagnetic, and nuclear have not overcome it. If a force can keep an object intact, even the expansion of the universe cannot change it. Space is expanding at all scales, but expansion only affects all objects collectively. Between two points in space, the space will expand at a certain rate. But if this rate is slower than the escape velocity between two objects, if there is a force binding them together, then the distance between them will not increase. No increase in distance means no effect from expansion. As a result, stable bound objects can survive unchanged in an expanding universe indefinitely. Thus, the greatest cosmic battle between gravity and expansion has been ongoing for billions of years. Who will win? Write in the comments. Also, don't forget to give a thumbs up to this video and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, this was the Space Progress Channel.